Uh, everything's under control. Situation normal. What happened? Uh, had a slight weapons malfunction, but uh, everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? Cinderella story. You want answers? We're on a mission from God. Inconceivable! Take your sticking paws off me! I'm afraid I can't do that. Have fun storming the castle! Hey everybody, welcome to the Story Cauldron, finding the folktales, fables, and philosophies behind your favorite Hollywood films. I'm Bobby the Movie Dude. I'm Anthony the Philosophy Guy. I'm Garrett, and I'm here. And here on the Story Cauldron, we take about an hour to explore the stories behind the cinematic stories you love. Really, it's all Tolkien's fault. His description of the cauldron of story, uh, out of which bubbles all the different tales that our cultures tell, really helps us to see that every story depends on the stories that came before it. And today, it's a movie about a poor, radicalized farmer who after losing his family in a military attack, runs away and destroys a government facility. It's Star Wars, Episode 4, A New Hope. (laughs) So, yeah, let's start with the movie itself. Uh, Garrett? Ooh, time to get my synopsis on. All righty. Princess Leia is on the run from Darth Vader carrying the stolen plans to the Empire's superweapon. When the droids R2-D2 and C-3PO escape from Vader's ship, they find themselves with Luke Skywalker, who led by the mysterious Ben Kenobi, meets up with Han Solo and Chewbacca to rescue Leia, deliver the plans, and eventually blow up the Death Star. Honestly, if you don't know these names, then what rock have you been living under? And it's okay, because I've been living under that same rock until about three weeks ago. And we have the story geeks to thank for that one. (laughs) Thank you. Now, Garrett, was that intentional? Like, had you avoided watching Star Wars? Or how was it that you managed to live almost two decades without ever seeing this movie or any of these movies? You mean I did live two decades without seeing any of these movies? Um, He's almost 21. (laughs) Oh, that's right. (laughs) I'm getting old. Um, Shut up. (laughs) <laughs> I remember my cousins watching them, and that made me a little like, I don't want to watch these. Um, but no, there was really no reason besides just never doing it. And for all those people that were like, you've never seen Star Wars? Well, nobody forced me to watch it, so you were slacking. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Bobby's fault. Hey, you know, I uh, I didn't watch it very much. <laughs> I really uh, didn't. So, uh, yeah, I, I ended up watching it for the first time when I was, oh, I would say seven, I think. Mm-hmm. I was about seven years old. And it was my neighbor who uh, was like, hey, this is the best movie ever. Uh, it's amazing. It will change your life. Let's watch it. And so we watched it, and he hyped it up too much. Oh. At seven years old, I was like, I was about to say, it wasn't as imagine. good as you said it was. I am so <laughs> depressed. You know, I can because imagine he's like Bobby being like, I would have liked to have seen this, this, and this. In this film. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Like it really wasn't the best. Well, when that, when you think about it, like it's, it's a great film, but when uh, when I was six and seven years old, I was like, I, I don't like science fiction, man. <laughs> mm. Which is you know kind of weird for I, I think uh, a six or seven year old kid. But I was all about the adventure stories. I loved. I had just got done reading. Uh, Treasure Island. That was the first chapter book that I read, and my parents were like, "Yeah, you got it. You finished your first chapter book. You're six years old. Here's a candy bar." And I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> I want to like go explore Earth and jungles, go and not necessarily treasure. like space." Oh, okay. So yeah, oh, that's another reason I'm terrified of space and dying in space. So right, <laughs> like that that didn't help me come and see it before did you feel kind of bad for darth vader at the end when he's just spiraling off into the void with with the velociraptor sounds (laughs) yeah because he's he's basically going to be embodying your greatest fear being lost in space oh i didn't feel that bad that's another franchise we need to talk about Mm. danger (laughs) danger well uh, for me uh this is one of those movies that i don't remember watching for the first time The original Star Wars came out in 1977. My dad had... He was either a senior in high school or he had just graduated from high school. And he went to see this 
17 times in the theater. Oh, wow. Woof. So you can imagine what kind of uh, uh, upbringing I had with, with Star Wars. It just, it was an ever-present reality. Now, he, yeah, wasn't, yeah. he wasn't one of the kind of guys who would go to the, the cons and dress up and stuff. Unfortunately, I think that would have been a lot of fun. <laughs> but, uh, but I... I mean, the, the, the massive revelation. Now it, now it's like this cool thing to w- record your kids watching Empire for the first time and, and when they find oh, out yeah, yeah. about the, the whole big twist with the father. I don't remember that. It's uh, it's because, always been there. Right. I was yeah. probably four or five or I don't know. So our dad was finishing up high school as well, and he had a little brother. Well, he has a little brother. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So our uncle, yeah. So, uh, so our uncle, um, was quite a bit younger than our dad. And, uh, he had this problem with like not cleaning his room, but he was a huge star Wars fan. And one of the stories that I heard constantly growing up was how my dad went to go clean up my uncle's room and he just boxed up all of the star Wars memorabilia and oh, toys no. And just dropped him into the burn barrel. Oh, no. And <laughs> so <laughs> as, as you can see, my dad wasn't a huge Star Wars fan either. Yeah. But, um, oh, man. Well, we I heard about say that. It, but I think constantly. if I'm thinking of the correct uncle, I mean, he had it coming. <laughs> <laughs> just all over the house. No. Um, it, was, it was interesting. Like, it, Star Wars was never a big thing in our house. It, and that was probably one of the reasons why is my dad was just like I'm so sick of star wars stuff man <laughs> um well i mean it's certainly one of uh, the the biggest things out there i mean it's one of the highest grossing uh franchises of all time in yeah. fact uh, as yeah. far as franchises go it is the highest well i believe it's the highest grossing franchise it depends on how you calculate it yeah but as far as just individual movies go this first star wars probably if just in properties i'm sure uh, yeah. it's just uh it, this was the highest grossing movie of all time until et came along and it's still the second highest this first star wars movie when you adjust for inflation uh the only movie that beats it in terms of box office income is gone with the wind oh wow so this is second highest uh and then all eight, when you look at the top 100 grossing movies of all time, all eight of them are in the top 100, uh, including the, the two new ones, Force Awakens and Rogue One. Mm-hmm. And five are in the top 20. Wow. So That's crazy. And, and now that it's owned by Disney, and they're just, I'm sure, going to keep milking that train. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. To mix some metaphors there. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds difficult. They are going to, I'm sure, just keep keep printing their own money with it. But this first film really is, uh, it's, I think, set apart in a lot of ways, um, even within the franchise, this uh, A New Hope. And it's, I mean, it, it was a, it was kind of an amazing smash hit when it first came out. I, mean, I was watching uh, some interviews with people kind of talking about when it was in theaters. Pe- people were clapping, like they were applauding, uh, giving it standing ovations just in the you know random cinema down at the mall huh. uh, because it was so it, it, people connected with it in a in a rather visceral way and critics as well. I mean, it was nominated for ten Oscars. Wow! And it won all of the technical Oscars. It didn't win Best Picture. It did not win Best Director. Uh, but it won everything like. Uh, best, special effects. Yeah, and, best visual effects, best uh, editing, best costume design, all of that kind of uh, shit. Gotcha. Actually, no, it was nominated for wow. 11, 11 uh, Oscars. Um, so, yeah. And it obviously set off a uh, sensation. Uh, a craze. A craze, if you will. <laughs> but, oh, well, yeah, and it even won, I mean, it won all sorts of other awards. It won a Grammy. It won a bunch of Saturn Awards, which are for sci-fi. Gotcha, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I absolutely love the movie. Um, uh, just the one time where my friend was just like, ah, ah, I'm like, I don't know why you're freaking out, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. Uh, it, it's such a good movie. In fact, I watched it again last night just because I could. So. Okay, so where what uh, where can we go? What can we talk about here? Oh, we can talk about a lot of stuff. 
let's break it down. What do we have? We have the uh, we could talk about religion. We could talk about the original uh, concept in Japan. Uh, we could talk about the spoofs, the parodies. <laughs> we could talk about all of it. Let's talk about Japan. What are you What are you thinking of there? As a lot of westerns go, they were all based on um, like samurai movies and stuff. I mean, so to say western, are you? Like American westerns or American like spaghetti westerns. westerns. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think of the name now. <laughs> I... Yeah. Something you said earlier makes me, uh, makes me think we should talk about this as a science fiction movie versus, uh, something else. Like, like a, a Western, a, a Western maybe? movie. Yeah. I mean, it's got science fiction elements in it, it obviously it does. with yeah. space and space battles and, and things. But I would argue that it's, uh, it fits into, uh, at, at the very least, it's more of a fantasy film than a science fiction film. And and you're saying Western. What is it uh, about it that oh, you're thinking as a Western? You've got the uh, the lone hero, you know, meeting up with uh, other like-minded folks and destroying corruption in a town or, you know, something like that. Just um, on a much grander scale. Just on a, yeah, like a cosmic scale, you know. Uh, oh, cosmic. Cosmic. But yeah, I mean, and I think a lot of the uh, the opening visuals and stuff like that harken to a a western. You know, you have the the shootout followed by desert, and, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know it's cantinas and right, yeah, uh, you know a lot of this. Yeah, they they and they don't have a piano player, but they've got that awesome Moss Eisley band. Yes, exactly. You know, sure. um, but and there's always like the confrontation at the bar to. He doesn't like you. I don't like you either. You know, <laughs> um, and it, it makes me think of like all the westerns that I watched growing up uh, with my dad and grandpa. I mean, they were let's put it this way, religious about watching their westerns. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, every Sunday afternoon. I mean, w- there has been th- this is kind of a first for us on the Story Cauldron because we are talking about a movie that has been dissected so much. Oh, I mean, yeah. There, have, there are books and books that, uh, that have been published looking at the source material behind the Star Wars franchise. Uh, it, it's been hard to pin some of that down because George Lucas is not the most consistent person when he's telling <laughs> a story about where he came up with his ideas. But uh, there are some common threads that you see and Westerns and, and moving back behind Westerns, even uh, talking about some, like you said, samurai movies. One name that shows up a lot is Akira Kurosawa. Yes. Who, uh, whose movies like the hidden fortress are like when you have C3PO and R2D2 going out on their own, trying to uh, play this pivotal role in, in, fighting the the evil empire. I mean, that's something that uh, a lot of ho- folks point to some of Kurosawa's films and, and say, look, yeah, th- that's, this is exactly where Lucas got it from. Because you've got, in that movie, you've got these two friends who, who run away from a battle uh, to try and, and help this rebellion that's led by a princess. Uh, and it, it finishes with the old master fighting his student. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> sounds sounds pretty familiar. Yeah, sounds a little familiar yeah. there. <laughs> So, uh, it, George Lucas can be accused, uh, I think fairly of intentionally taking a lot of things like Kurosawa's films and, uh, uh some of the, uh, pulp fictional heroes that we've talked about before and, and uh, just other movies as well. I mean, yeah. war movies, that final scene in the trench, the famous, uh, run, uh, to destroy the death star takes, uh, it looks a lot like some war movies that were popular at, at the time and, and even before that, like the Dam Busters and things like that. Yeah. So, he- and I swear, some way that the uh, the Microsoft Maze screensaver is based <laughs> off of that scene. Oh man, I remember that. That yeah. Oh <laughs> wow! Just yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in, in fact, the. The, the idea of the story cauldron is, uh, you know, where you take a whole bunch of stuff and, and mix it and mash it all up together. I mean, that's that's basically what Lucas was quite consciously trying to do: take a bunch of stuff that he loved in various ways and say, let's let's turn it into a myth for the modern era. 
Uh-huh. Hey, let's make a movie. <laughs> Sounds kind of like what the Duffer Brothers just did. Hmm. Hmm. P- could, could that perhaps be why Stranger Things is one of the reasons why Stranger Things is so amazingly popular? Is a phenomena. Yeah, I, that's actually a good point. I suppose Stranger Things is kind of the the latest entry in that pop culture phenomenon that yeah. that Star Wars once inhabited. Everybody's talking about it. Oh, definitely. But have either of you guys watched any of uh, the old old Flash Gordon serials? Flash. Whoa. I have not. Flash Gordon. Have you you've heard of Flash Gordon? I yes. Yeah, and I ended up uh, listening to a lot of the old radio shows. Oh, that's cool. When we did audio production back in college, The Shadow and some of those other pulps. Well, Flash Gordon uh, (laughs) was one of George Lucas's favorite characters. Yeah, I can see that. Apparently, he actually started this Star Wars project. He, He wanted to adapt Flash Gordon for the screen. Uh, again, like he, he looked to try and buy the rights to Flash Gordon so that he could make a Flash Gordon movie, and he couldn't do it. Uh, 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 he they, he couldn't secure the legal rights to make the movie, and so to make a long story short, he basically said, "Well, fine, I'll just go <laughs> make my own," <laughs> and <laughs> that that let that was kind of the the push that led the snowball to start rolling down the hill that eventually led to what we now think of as Star Wars today. When he couldn't get the rights to a fictional space hero surrounded by uh, a princess and encountering evil empires and uh, trying to uh, survive in space battles and things like that, he said, you know what? I, I can make that story. Yeah. And... By, Laser guns. Ba-doo, ba-doo. by building on uh, some of these other things that he loved, uh, some of the other movies, he turned... And, and also, uh, with, with the help of, of people like Joseph Campbell, he developed this whole mythology yeah. that we now call Star Wars. The Force. I mean, so it's one of those funny, what if things had been different sort of questions. If, if he had actually been able to secure the rights to Flash Gordon... I don't know if we would really still remember George Lucas's name as we do. I mean, obviously he did other things like he had already done American yeah. graffiti, but, uh, but I mean, let's be honest when you think of George Lucas, it really starts with star Wars. And then we go back and say, Oh yeah. And he did some other cool stuff before it. Too. <laughs> I don't know. Not if you're my dad. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think I said it in like the last podcast or so that yeah. he's a huge fan of American graffiti, but he doesn't like star Wars much. So. <laughs> well, to each their own. To each their own. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> so all these things kind of came together in uh, in George Lucas's mind to create this. I I don't know what we would call it now. Like it's pastiche. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking of more like movement. Oh, but oh yeah. Okay, you're going a different direction. I was I was going a little bit different Take direction. It. Considering we still have movies coming out. Oh, um, hello. Like that's oh, right. Yeah. Like now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, we are uh, we are just days away from episode eight. Yeah, exactly. So, oh boy, um, oh to boy. think that this started how many years ago was this? Like forty? Yep. Yeah, forty years ago, and uh, we're we're still getting movies in the franchise <laughs> with some of the original characters. Well, yeah, and I mean, actors for that matter. Yeah, as long as they're still around. As yes. long as they're still around. Yeah. <laughs> But it's it's incredible wow. that that's got that much staying power. Yeah. Well, I think that when you are dealing with universal themes and tropes and characters like this movie does, it's something that it resonates really deeply within the, the audience, so that you almost can't help but love at least parts of it. I mean, you might yeah. think that. I think everybody has a little bit of Han Solo in them when he's all sarcastic and and talking about (laughs) hokey religions. And and, I mean, yeah, everybody, especially in 2017, we're real skeptical about that kind of thing. But uh, at the same time, even even Han Solo comes back at the end of the movie. Yeah. You can't stay away. Yeah. So I, I, I name dropped somebody earlier. Uh, D- Joseph Campbell. Yes. There's another name that you, you really can't appreciate the origin of Star Wars if you don't appreciate Joseph Campbell. Uh, and it occurs to me that I'm kind of, 
I think we may have done ourselves a disservice by waiting 20 episodes before mentioning him on this podcast. Uh, Because Joseph... uh, Yeah, yeah, I agree. (laughs) Right? Uh, I mean, because Joseph Campbell's whole idea of the monomyth and and the psychological underpinnings for storytelling is also pretty much what Tolkien is talking about with the story cauldron, right? I could have swore we talked about it in a little bit, but we never brought up his name. (laughs) Yeah. But we, we talked about some of his uh, storytelling elements. Did we? we I, I think we did. Didn't we? No, I don't know. Well, I, know I, I don't remember. We've mentioned the hero's journey before a lot. Well, not necessarily a lot, but I do remember that we, <laughs> we mentioned, mentioned it. it. How about that? <laughs> um, especially the one that comes to mind is the Black Cauldron episode, first episode, because we were talking about Tarin and That's that whole right. yeah. thing. So, so yeah. what? Um, let's recap. <laughs> let's 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 sum up. What is the hero's journey? Well, Bobby, you are on the mic. Um. All right. Well, I wasn't prepared for this part. <laughs> You're on the spot. I'm in the spotlight. Usually, I have a little diagram, big old circle. You know. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. I love that big circle. Mm-mm. It's true. Like we went through that with uh, Beowulf my senior year of high school. We went through like the entire hero's journey. So what, what's the idea of it? Uh, it's the journey of a hero. Oh, you good. <laughs> well done. Points <laughs> to you. All right. I graduated. You're, gl- you're, I, you're lucky you're not in the same room, so well, I can't smack you upside the head right now. All right. Well, Sorry. I, <laughs> I mean, ooh, today. Ooh, ooh. You're not wrong. So <laughs> just so it's uh, – when I teach it, I teach it alongside Greek mythology. And I – yeah, and I, I teach it with Greek mythology, and then I always parallel a movie that the entire class is familiar with, and we kind of go from there. Last two years, uh, it's been The Sandlot. Oh, nice. Uh, you know, it's because, you know, that's, that's pretty... It's a great movie. Yeah, it's... Yeah. It works. It does. Well, anyway, the hero's journey, uh, we have... We, we start out, it's it's the ordinary world, same as what we're doing right now, the same as if you're driving in your car right now listening to this, it's the plain Jane, ordinary world, nothing special, right? But something always happens. Like there's what they call the call to adventure. And uh, so that means something happens to where uh, an individual, nothing special, you know, like could be you, me, Somebody out there listening has to step up and uh, take this call to adventure or this position of power to where they can fix something, you know, or they can rescue someone. They can do anything, you know, that they need to do uh, just because they stepped up to do it. Then usually I explain to them, like, okay, um, it could be a problem. Uh, It could be, in the case of the Sandlot, the ball going over the fence, it could be uh, a space station that's about to blow up a bunch of planets. It could be... <laughs> Basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It could be... Um, I don't know. It could be trying to go find something to make your father Zeus proud. I don't know. Um, <laughs> any, any of these things. Um, Hashtag Hercules. <laughs> and usually along that journey, you know, you step up. You're like, okay, I'm going to do this somebody pops out of the woodwork and that's your mentor. You always meet a mentor, someone to kind of dig deeper into the backstory or else, you know, train you to give you the information, the the special abilities, whatever it is that you need to accomplish this job. And they also like will give you some sort of nugget of information. Like Oh yeah. Your father was a Jedi. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And we move on the journey or the hero cycle. The hero is presented with a tool. Now, it could be like a magical tool. It could be uh, 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 something that goes, I don't know. Um, But they're presented with a tool that will help them along their way. I mean, and it keeps going on and on and on, and I could spend probably another hour talking about this, but long story short, there's conflict. There's uh, usually some sort of failure and rebirth uh, or failure and uh, an epiphany. Um, Yeah, anything like that. 
and then we go into the uh, the actual battle or the the real conflict and who usually wins who always wins in this case it's the hero the hero um so yeah i mean it's you wow. you go through this entire uh story you could dig really deeply mm-hmm. into it and we could parallel this movie a new hope not not the whole full saga but just the just the movie the new hope because that's what we're focusing on today right mm-hmm. okay um and you can find some of these things um you can also find it in countless other movies it's a great storytelling device and it usually uh just gives you the breakdown of and a story arc and a character arc that people just go crazy for yeah yeah so joseph campbell who kind of popularized this framework he was um he was a college professor he he was a writer and and he did a lot of work in comparative religion and noticed that a lot of these stories that are told cross culturally, like no matter where you look, what no matter what continent, what what uh, ethnic group, the these stories they all follow this same kind of pattern that Bobby was just laying out here, and uh, where where these these heroes they are uh, they are forced to leave their. Uh, their their familiar world and do crazy things and then come back to their familiar world now changed and so Joseph Campbell spent his career basically uh, popularizing and 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 demonstrating the different steps he broke down seventeen different stages yeah like I said we could spend hours on <laughs> this stuff right. uh, it is a lot but I love it so much well yeah and and George Lucas loved it too that's the funny thing is that when he was he actually paid Campbell to come on set when they were writing and and shooting the the uh, the original Star Wars movie to be an advisor and, and like a, uh, not necessarily a writer. I don't think he got a writing credit, but he still was a consultant. That's the word pointing out different things, making suggestions and constantly referring back to these, these different stages. And, and in fact, Campbell himself would frequently after the movies had come out, um, you know, into the, into the eighties and nineties, uh, he would, or, 80s. I think he died before that. Anyway, uh, into the after all after the original trilogy was complete, he would cite Star Wars as kind of the prime modern example of yeah. his ideas. So, like he did a he did a, a a PBS special which was turned into a book with Bill Moyers, where they spent. I mean, they they spent like. 20 minutes just talking about Star Wars <laughs> and, and how it, it demonstrates a lot of the different tropes and the different stages in, in the process. So, um, yeah. And, and I think, I mean, as I was, as I was watching it again, I, I actually wrote down, uh, the different stages of the hero's journey. And it's, it's funny. It's not one of those things that is necessarily completely linear. Like you don't have to yeah. hit all of those 17 stages. Uh, some of them are kind of interchangeable. Some of them you might skip and, and some you might move around and, and, you know, you might have stage 12 back before stage four actually happens. But this, uh, when, when it was really easy, <laughs> I think to fill out this, uh, the, these different stages with the different plot points that episode four goes through. So, I mean, you just did, uh, I mean, uh, a, a good breakdown of, of the the basic pattern, but tell me, I mean, I mean, think about, uh, think, tell me, tell me what you think of of this. When we've got that call to adventure, when yeah. Luke is is on Tatooine and he's confronted with these droids, mm-hmm. and uh, and and he's he's happy. He's got a he's got his good life. He's living um, uh, on the moisture farm. He's excited to go off and, and join the evil empire. Yeah. But uh, then these droids come in and they they change everything, you know, especially yeah, yeah. R two. He runs off, and then he's given this this opportunity to go and rescue this princess. And Ben um, Ben shows up. Uh, uh, Obi Wan Kenobi shows mm-hmm. up and uh, rescues him from the from the Sand Raiders. Uh, and so here, all within the first like 20 minutes of the film, you've got the call to adventure. You've got him refusing the call. Uh, yeah. You've got Ben as the source of supernatural aid. 
and th- and everything seems like it's going to just uh, go nowhere until he returns home and he finds his parents have been killed. And, and so he has to cross that first threshold. That's the uh, you know one of the next stages in Campbell's departure arc. Uh, you have to cross this first threshold from your familiar world out into the new world. Yeah. And, and as soon as your parents, I mean, his parents have died. And, and that, yeah, that hits your point of no return for uh, any screenwriting buffs, you know. Um, that is your, your act shift. So. so then after that, where does he go? He goes to, uh, what, uh, what Campbell would say is his absolute favorite scene in any movie <laughs> was the Moss Eisley scene in A New Hope. Which yeah. is not just a description of the great soundtrack. I love that music. <laughs> but, I mean, when you think of Moss Eisley, what, uh, uh, what do you think about it? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's what I think of, the music. I think it's, it's true. I think it's time to get a new ringtone on my phone. <gasps> oh, ooh, put that up on the YouTube. I'll download it. That's right. But uh, so one of the big stages for um, for Campbell is called the belly of the whale, uh, and it, it's this moment where the it, it's it's kind of the final uh, the final break. You, you say point of no return. That this is yeah. this is the point of of absolute no return between what you know and what you don't know, and. That's uh, I would say that's Moss Eisley because uh, still yeah. at that point he still could uh, Luke st- the hero still could turn around and go home and just kind of you know clean up his yeah. his uh, the carcasses of his loved ones and then live a very sad life. Oh, that's so dark, right? Oh, yeah, be sad. you have to use the word carcass, Anthony. Well, okay, the um, desecrated corpses <clears throat> not better. <laughs> it's it's yeah. harsh. It is. It's bad. Yeah. Um, but they go through, and and uh, that's where he makes his his choice. His choice, and he crosses that threshold, and he goes off with Han Solo, and um, and and they go through this road of trials. That's the the next uh, uh, stage in the hero's journey, where they they have to prove the hero has to prove that he is a a hero, that he's successful. They they go they make it into the Death Star. Um, and, and if you think in the Death Star, there's there's actually a couple of different sequences where they have to hide. They're they're stuck in the trash compactor. Yeah. There's that great moment with the swing uh, where they where he has to swing over the oh yeah over the chasm where it makes his little grappling hook. <laughs> yeah. Which does that ever get used again? Uh, yeah, well, I think he just leaves it and just kind of like oh yeah, but he never gets another one. I mean, uh, I don't think so. Like it's not a, a device that <laughs> you never think you think of Luke Skywalker's. Uh, Lightsaber, obviously. You think of his land speeder. I always wanted the land speeder. Yeah, that was. But that you was don't think cool. of his grappling hook. It yeah, it, it's true. I, maybe weird. it's like a Swiss Army knife in that galaxy <laughs> far, far away. Oh, yeah, nobody cares. You Every, know, everybody's kind of like, I have found it in a Cracker Jack box. <laughs> ah, it's disposable. <laughs> But, but it came in useful, right? It, yeah. I mean, yeah. Where else would you be without it? You, that's also the site of one of our uh, favorite story cauldron tropes. That scene includes a Wilhelm scream. It does. It does. And I watched it again last night, and I threw my arms up in the air, Woo-hoo. and Melissa was just looked up at me. Wilhelm scream. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next, Campbell talks about an important stage in a lot of myths being the meeting with the goddess. Mm. Uh, and and he, he talks about this as... Uh, it, it, can, it can show up in a few different ways, but me- meeting with someone who is kind of the embodiment of of purity, the embodiment of youthfulness, someone who is beautiful. And I, I think that moment when Luke actually meets Leia for the first time oh, yeah. is, uh, well, she looks almost angelic. She turns around and... And, and insults him right off the bat. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> That's... Uh, God bless Carrie Fisher. But that, uh, I would say, I, I know later on, obviously, it, it's hard to interpret that scene without the knowledge that they are related. Yeah, yeah. True. But it really doesn't seem like that's what what Lucas was thinking when he wrote that scene <laughs> the first time. Yeah. Uh, especially with the, the, the kiss in Empire. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that he wasn't thinking. I mean, I know now. Oh, you, my gosh. Pipe down. We get it. They kiss. Move on. <laughs> Sorry. 
I'm just, yeah. yeah. Okay. And well, anyway, fair point. So, <laughs> uh, one of, uh, um, what, this, this is also one of the places where you have a, a stage in the hero's journey, which is kind of optional. I mean, it, it might go, um, with the meeting of, of the goddess, or it might go into meeting the woman as a temptress, which would be not really something you see. I mean, it, uh, the, I, I think you can describe Leia in a lot of ways, but temptress is not really one of them. Uh, no, no. So the atonement with the father would be the next step that the person has to confront, um, or, or a father figure or someone who kind of symbolizes power in general. These are very <laughs> fluid categories. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're very uh, flexible in a lot of ways. So even though, again, it's not really clear whether he was thinking that Vader was going to be the father from that first movie or not. Um, when you have, um, the encounter between Ben and Vader and they fight. Yeah. Uh, that's the only time in the movie where Luke ever actually is in the same room as Vader. Hmm. Do you notice that? When, when they're across the room from each other? Uh, that's true, yeah, They yeah. never actually speak to each other in the first movie. Uh, I mean, now obviously they're close to each other in the trench at the end. Yeah. But... They're never in the same space. Yeah, the only time is in that, that scene after they've rescued the princess and they've almost got her back on the Falcon and they see the fight between Ben and Vader from across the way. Yeah. And, and uh, Ben sacrifices himself. And Luke just screams and starts shooting. Yeah, right? Like, come on, man. You really, he's a kid. Well, you yeah. This is a war, Luke. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to be quiet and sneaky. But, ah! <laughs> but in Campbell's, in, in Campbell's framework, the atonement with the father typically leads right into the moment called the apotheosis, which is the, mm-hmm. it's the point where the greater understanding that you've been looking for f- is finally realized. I'm glad you're using all these words because I don't usually use them within ninth grade English. See, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I took notes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the apotheosis is, I, I think it's the moment when he, when you, right after Ben has died, but then you hear his voice. Yeah. yeah and, you know, he says, run Luke, run. <laughs> and <laughs> run. <laughs> you have to, I mean, think, think about it. I can only imagine what that would have been like in the movie theater to yeah. hear that for the first yeah. time. You just watched this guy die, but he, then he, he kind of mysteriously disappeared and you're like, Oh, that's weird. There's no body. What does that mean? And then you hear his voice. Uh, yeah. You can tell you've already seen stuff with the force be this, this kind of powerful thing. You've seen Vader choke a guy. You, you've, you can tell, okay, there's, there's something something weird about this this power yeah. but yeah. now you realize that it even has some power over death this is i mean that, that it's kind of an amazing moment yeah uh and and the, the whole point in campbell's framework for, of the apotheosis is that it, it gives you this new knowledge and this new way of seeing everything and i think that um that when Ben is struck down mm. and becomes more powerful than you could possibly imagine, Doc. <laughs> uh, that that that's this this moment of the apotheosis, which which then leads into the the ultimate boon or the goal of the quest as a whole, which is to rescue the princess. So, like they they manage yeah. to do it, they get away from the Death Star, and you get pro- what I'm guessing is Garrett's favorite moment with the the space battle. Because you just love the idea of dying in space, right? I love it. Yeah. You know, for uh. being so open, I would feel so claustrophobic. I, I, I'm uh. so oh. happy I'm smiling, but you just can't see it. Talk about claustrophobic. Uh, what do you think of the trash compactor scene? <laughs> okay, but that was a lot. Because, like, they're literally in trash. <laughs> it's another kind of belly of the whale moment. Gross. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um Campbell compared that scene to the story of Jonah in the Bible. Oh, yeah. Hence yeah. the belly of the whale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, oh my <laughs> it God. used to terrify yeah. me. That scene was, it would scare oh, me. Oh yeah. I, I hated, uh, it's like thinking about being buried alive. 
It's just like slow crushing. Well, actually, it, the crushing part didn't bother me. Uh, it was entirely was it the, 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 thing the thing in the water. Uh, the, the, oh, thing. Just, the the fact that you can kind of see it, but not it. It, it, it does has the, an eye. It does. We the know jaws. it has an eye. <laughs> yeah, it does the jaws thing really well, where you yeah. you just get flashes of the monster and your imagination. Yeah, you get rest. flashes, and then you have the uh, the effect of the monster when it mm-hmm. drags Luke oh. under. Yeah, and that was the part. Like oh. the rest of it, I was kind of like, okay, like blah, blah, I get it. And then when they pulled Luke under the water, I was like, oh god, <laughs> that's <laughs> a lot. Part of me, I always, I, I got confused by that about the the structure of that room. How it looked yeah. like they're only standing in like a foot of water, but then he's completely, but then he's submerged. completely submerged, and yeah, I would, yeah. Um, well, it was really funny because Melissa it was okay. So last night was the first time that Melissa had ever seen Star Wars. <gasps> what? Yes. Well, I'm glad. Oh my you, gosh! Now I'm you can marry that her. <laughs> That's okay. Good. So That's anyway, I'm now that you guys that know that Star Wars for a podcast. Um, yeah, and she's she said the same exact thing. And it's like, so are they standing on trash, or is there <laughs> is there a floor? What's happening? Because he just went under. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Um, there, there was a there, didn't even never thought about that to be honest. There was a, a video game that my brother and I used to play called Dark Forces. It was one oh, of yeah. the, one of the older Star Wars games. And the third or fourth level, you were in not you, you weren't in the Death Star. That was the first level, but you were in some I forget world. But there, there, those monsters were there, like the oh, yeah. the, the creature that's yeah. in the trash compactor. And it would jump up right in front of you. You'd be running through water or something, and it would jump up right in front of you. And it, I hated it. I, uh, I, I like I would stop playing the game because of that. Yeah, I can't blame moment. that. That would that's traumatizing. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, okay. So they get away from the Death Star, and uh, then uh, see Campbell breaks his hero's journey down in kind of three stages, where you've got the the descent, or not not um, no the departure, the departure, the initiation. And then the return. Yeah. So uh, you have to cross cross this return threshold. You have to go back into your normal life now changed as the hero. So he's rescued the princess, but the story isn't over. The Death Star isn't hasn't blown up yet. Yeah. And so the Death Star follows them to to Yavin Four. Uh, there's one of the next stages in this return is the magic flight. Ha <laughs> ha. And what I have to say is, like, the coolest looking spaceship ever. The X-Wing fighter is so oh, cool. Oh, I thought you were talking about the Millennium Falcon. Oh, no. Well, that too. But <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, you're like, you flew here in that? You're braver than I thought, you know? Um, <laughs> oh, I, shame. <laughs> I, seriously. Again, Carrie Fisher. Growing up, yeah, though. Those. The X-wing oh. fighter I thought looked so cool. Oh sure, and like, it, and the, it it moves into yeah. battle positions like boo. Yeah, why? Well, it I, yeah, I agree. So anyway, I just I, had to I throw that wanted, out there. I always preferred the Falcon, though. I have to admit. Oh uh, really? See, mm-hmm. I always preferred I the X-wing, and but then I, I was I, like, I preferred building Han Solo up Legos in every way. I wanted to be Han Solo. Yeah, I don't blame you there. I mean, I get it though. <laughs> so there's actually a song called Han Solo. Just throwing that out there. It's pretty great. The entire thing is I want to take a shower with Han Solo. <laughs> ten by out who? Ten. Han Solo by who? Uh, you can look Chewy. it up on YouTube, um, but it's <laughs> performed by Jason uh, Gote. Okay. Right on. Just saying, it's it's an excellent song. I'll find a link to it for the show notes here. Ooh, please do. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the uh, the magic flight the hero he has to escape um, and uh, he it, it's this dangerous return um, you kind of get that with the space battle yeah um, as they're fleeing the Death Star but then obviously uh, a, a, a the flight with the trench uh, where mm-hmm. they have to fly through um, to to destroy the Death Star uh, my favorite moment in the movie though it f- corresponds with Campbell's stage called the rescue from without uh the hero needs guides he needs assistance like you were saying yeah. ben kenobi he really fits that the, the kind of the old man the yeah the mentor uh, the, the mentor trope absolutely han solo and chewy fit that as well um the these kind of rugged bandits uh rescuing or, or saving him uh, helping him out at kind of like uh yeah friends or assistance type of a right kind of a helper 
I guess. So in the hero's journey, the rescue from without at the end is when one of those guides or assistants uh, comes back to bring to help usher them back into everyday life. Uh, especially if the hero needs help, like if the hero is wounded or something like that, and, and uh, still, or when, Darth Vader's on his tail. Every time, I can't, I can't tell you how excited I get. Like my my heart sings <laughs> when you hear that that whoop from uh, from Han Solo. Yeah, now let's blow this thing and go home. <laughs> like ah, <laughs> you're clear, kid. Th- yeah, there is just no part of that that isn't beautiful. Oh, that's and, good, and it, it's it's that moment uh, for Campbell where where the hero is rescued, and then there's nothing left to stop the the return uh, th- uh, threshold from being crossed. Yeah. So, and uh, everybody's safe after the the death. Well, except if you were on the Death Star, then you're yeah, not. So that's true. And then you gone. Then yeah. There were only two more stages in the hero's journey. The master of two worlds, which I do think is exemplified really well by Luke turning off his tracker. Yeah. The master of two worlds is, is it shows the change in the hero, how he is. He the accepts same, the force. Yeah. He accepts yeah. it. He's the same person at the beginning. He's the same um uh, he's the same character, but he has now changed. He is he is the master of the old world and the new world. It's that, or not quite the epiphany moment, but it's the result of the epiphany. Exactly, yeah. It's yeah. showing that, that balance in the new person. And so when he turns that uh, that tracker off and is, and is still able to win, oh, yeah. And everybody at the base Glorious. is like, um... He, he he turned his tracker off, guys. <laughs> yeah, they're all they're all afraid about it. Um, yeah, let's see how this goes. <laughs> and the last stage uh, that Campbell talks about is the freedom to live, where the the, the person no longer fears death. Uh, they they are genuine in their in, in their acceptance of this new stage of life. And uh, I think you also kind of see that in. Um, I wrote, I wrote yeah that's where he turns off the targeting computer there too so. They kind of overlap. Yeah. And and you get back, and, and there's this uh, nice gigantic little, celebration. A ceremony. Everybody gets a medal, except for Chewbacca. Yeah. Oh, I've, this is a little bit out there, but have you seen that scene uh, where somebody's edited all of the music out? Oh, yes. Oh. Yes, I have. Oh, that's so, so awkward. awkward. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> Because it just, there's it just no goes dialogue. To show, yeah, there's no dialogue, and it just goes to show you how genius that music is. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, John Williams. This movie would not be what it oh, is no, if it not, wasn't for not John at Williams. All. He was able Truth. to really tell the story. John Williams. Uh, uh, we, so many good movies, too. We use, we'll uh, I actually later. use Star Wars in, in class when we talk about leetvorts and, and leet motifs mm-hmm. as... as uh, 10 out of 10. Right? Because uh, in biblical studies, there, there's different parts of the Bible where words get repeated over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And it kind of sets the tone for the, the passage you're talking about. And the word leetvort comes from the same idea as a leap motif where the same little snippets of music get used over and over how how each of the characters in Star Wars has has uh, their own little their theme own, yeah even if it's just a couple of measures long you still recognize oh yeah that's Luke oh yeah there we go that's the don 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 yeah. like you know who that is exactly yeah uh, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of uh, a lot of composers do it another great example is um, Howard Shore with the Lord of the Rings yeah, um, yeah. music for the original Lord of the Rings trilogy mm-hmm. and uh, so Man, John Williams was a master, and I'm really excited that he uh, he's still around because he's he's still involved with the new movies as well. Yeah, a bit. yeah. So he can keep working his magic. Woo woo! But yeah, there we go. Yes. There's the the hero's journey. Yeah, that only took most of the hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, well, it, that brings us to uh, a couple of other things. We've touched on it, but we haven't really. Uh, fleshed it out yet, but we need to talk about the force and uh, and religion, really. Yes, please. That, I that love hokey about religion, religion from Anthony. Right? <laughs> well, uh, what what does what do you think of when you think of the force and and the modern world? Where do you think that came from? Yoga. <laughs> oh, okay, so you're honestly not entirely off track here. Why are you thinking yoga though? Um, because I do yoga sometimes, but also, uh, I have a very spiritual teacher professor here at college. Um, 
and she always likes to do things that focus on your breathing and feeling the earth meet your feet and then feeling the energy coming through and stuff like that. And I was like, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I see you. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, I, uh, the, the idea from, I mean, when it comes to religion and actually the story geeks did uh, a really good job. I forget which episode they were talking about it in, but I think that Jay was right. He, he argued that the original Star Wars trilogy demonstrates mainly Eastern religious values, mm-hmm. but the prequel trilogy demonstrates mainly Western religious values. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think he's really onto something with that. With this original Star Wars trilogy you see this idea of the the energy force that's connecting all things that ties all things together and it's left very uh very, just very unclear exactly what that is or how it works it's just the force yeah yeah it, it's, very ambiguous it's ambiguous and and in the little descriptions you do get of it especially once yoda shows up and and starts oh, uh, teaching people him. more about it um it looks a lot like some of the Eastern ideas about your chi or the, the life force of the universe, uh, of all living things, the energy that you might be trying to help, um, not necessarily control when you're doing yoga, but allowing it to flow in the best way possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and yeah, breathing deeply. Open those conduits. Conduits, yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so it sounds like your uh, yoga instructor is like a, like a, I don't know. Uses That's not my yoga instructor. That's my acting professor. Your acting professor. <laughs> oh, oh. All right. Oh. oh, okay. Shout out to Tracy. Love you. But in, <laughs> in Western religious ideas, you, you have much more of a picture of, of the good God and the evil devil. Yeah. But that's not really what you have with the force. You've got the light side of the force and the dark side of the force. But it, it's the, your yin and yang. Your yin and yang. Yeah. yeah, they're they're neither one is now. You gotta let me finish before I, I before you respond. Neither one of them is really necessarily portrayed as being better than the other. Now, obviously, Darth Vader's the bad guy. He's mm. killing people with the Force, and I mean, I think George Lucas is a Westerner, so it's kind of impossible to completely extricate yourself from those Western ideas of good versus evil. But certainly in the language that they use within the movie to talk about the force, when, when it's talking about being in balance, yeah, balance requires two sides. You yeah, need exactly. The, you need the good and the, um, well, and, and evil isn't, well, it, it, I take it back. It is actually used in the crawl, isn't it? Talking about the evil empire. The yeah. empire is certainly evil, but the force is kind of left up to be more ambiguous. Yeah. Well, in fact... <laughs> In the movie, most people uh, just write off the force. Hey, it's an old hokey religion, right? Yeah. And there's only yeah. two real pract- or practitioners of that religion, and that would be Ben Kenobi and Darth Vader. Yeah. And they balance each other out pretty well, I would say. One is well, the- doesn't the Emperor also use the force? Yeah, but he's not in this first one. Oh, God, I'm starting to fall apart. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting everything mixed up in you're my brain. Yeah, you're right. Entire universe. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. But he's just not in this first movie. Yeah. and that's hard. Yeah. I, I know to, to, to kind of partition this one movie off from all the others in a way. Yeah. But because yeah, obviously there are other ones out there. Yoda yeah, and, of course. And well, like, and yeah, and hype. it doesn't really help that like I watched the original trilogy in a 24 hour period. What are you talking about? That is the exact right way to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, but now everything just sort of blends together. Oh, fair point. Yeah. 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 So it's hard to separate each individual movie. But anyway, carry on. Sorry. So we Emperor, can't, we, we can't right now. talk about the yin and the yang idea, like out of Taoism or something, but there are actually, no, that, that would probably be one of the better ones to look at would be the, the idea of the, the darkness, not necessarily being evil, but a necessary part of the universe. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the point is not to snuff out the darkness, but to balance it with the appropriate amount of light. And I think that's something that we'll see. Maybe I'm hoping I'm really hoping that that is going to be a theme in this new movie that's coming out in a few days. Uh, Because just from the trailers, it looks like they're going to be playing with that. With with the character of Kylo Ren and the character of Rey, it looks like it might be a little more complicated 
than yeah, certainly yeah. The Force Awakens. I know a lot of people insulted The Force Awakens for just kind of being a rehash of A New Hope, and it was obviously very similar in a lot of ways. But the, I think one of the big differences is that it look, it's a lot more complicated with these main characters. You, yeah. It's a lot harder to just say, oh, well, Kylo Ren's a bad guy. Like, well, I mean, he kind of is, but he, it also, you can tell there's something else going on here behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. So if they're going to play that up in the new, in this new movie and in, in Balance an complicated nine, with complicated. Maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah. they can play more with this idea of balance rather than the Western idea of defeating good with, or defeating evil with good. <laughs> hey, oh, don't want to wow. go the other way. Hopefully that's not a Freudian slip. <laughs> oh. Oh. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I, yeah, the way I was looking at it, though, is it's not until... Uh, so the way I was looking at it, it's not until uh, Vader strikes down Ben um, that there's an imbalance in this first movie um, that Luke kind of steps in because it's not right. talking about him being powerful with the Force until afterward. Yeah. So... Um, it just kind of, I feel like, all right, well, we've got too much dark now. We need to incorporate some light with Luke and we'll see how that all goes together. Yeah. You think maybe that's why Ben allowed himself to be struck down too? Ooh. Because honestly, he throws that fight. Yeah. Right. He closes his eyes. And he just, body gone. And disappears. Yeah. Ten, ten. So before we run out of time. We definitely need to address all of the retellings, nah, the parodies, yes. the spoofs. Yeah, because that's where this is just going now. Yeah. yeah, because I mean, we, it's like I said, it's a movement. It's a Star Wars movement, and everybody's kind of. If Mel Brooks is making fun of you, then you you've made, made it. it. Yeah, you've made it. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, Spaceballs still one of my favorite movies, and weirdly enough, my dad's. Also, um, <laughs> wait, he likes space balls more space than he likes Star Wars. He just not a big oh, fan. He says a lot about a man. He's the biggest Mel Brooks fan. He I is. Know. He Fair is. enough. He trained us well. <laughs> <laughs> so is that your favorite Star Wars parody? Or, or oh, or man, I something, something, something dark side is pretty great, too. Um, just I the family guy ones, person, too. So I can't. I can't go with family guy. Sorry, Bob. No, no, I'm just saying I, I love them all. I really do. Even a shout but, out to Robot Chicken for all of those oh, little, yes. uh, you know, snippets of scenes. I, I love it. Oh my gosh, I forgot about those. I love those. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that it's a mark of its um, of of its cultural position that those shows can make fun of, of something. And, and even if I mean, you you don't have to have seen Star Wars to appreciate. Uh, those Family Guy spoofs, for example. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you even if you've never seen, tell me, tell me this, Gary. Even before you had seen Star Wars, if somebody was talking about Luke Skywalker, would you still know what they were talking about? Oh yeah, the only thing that I didn't know was um, that Anakin Skywalker was also Darth Vader. Oh okay, so that part was a big surprise. What, was there anything? But it else? wasn't that big of a surprise because the first time I attempted to watch Star Wars. I went to my friend's house. She was like, oh, my gosh, we're going to watch Star Wars. It's going to be great. Which one do you want to watch? And I said, I want to watch A New Hope. I want to watch the first one because that's how it should be. And she said, "Mm, let's watch episode one, The Phantom Menace. (laughs) And And so this person is no longer your friend, right? (laughs) I mean, we don't talk much anymore. (laughs) But and then, like, as I was sitting there, I was like, who the hell is Anakin? Why does it matter? (laughs) And she was like, you don't know who that is? are you really that behind? I was like, I've never seen star Wars. You're not helping me. So like, that was the only thing that was. Surprising. Yeah. So, no, I, I totally tangent. agree. You have to watch the original three in order right. and then you can go watch the others. But. I still don't. I don't think my wife has actually seen the prequels. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah, uh, if only. <laughs> That's okay. Let her watch Gilmore <laughs> no, just... Girls. She needs to get that done first. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah, the original and, I, I'm not surprised that it's uh, that, that you still knew that much. Though. Really, though, there was nothing else that was a surprise to you. You were that familiar with everything. Well, it's a huge part of our culture. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, I mean, and that's, also that's everybody impressive. just shut up already about Luke kissing his sister. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. 
it's so awkward though, isn't it? It is. Well, I mean, now if you watch Game of Thrones, it's a lot worse. But that's uh, <laughs> a different story for a different. But day. since we are talking about parodies and spoofs, yes, there is another video that I love so much, and it's every single time the lightsabers hit each other. Instead of the sound they make, <laughs> it's Owen Wilson Owen saying, Wilson, wow. Yeah. "Wow, wow, wow, uh, there, wow!" There's uh, there's a lot of I saw another one of those that exact same kind yeah, of thing. I saw it this today morning with Michael Jackson. Yeah, with, with Michael uh-huh. Mike Jackson sounds. Michael Jackson. We watch at least one of those once a week. In my oh, friend group. It's, the it's internet great. is a beautiful, disgusting place. <laughs> oh, truly. <laughs> truly. I thought you were going to go with Star Wars Kid, though. Remember Star Wars Kid? the Doing the lightsaber battle in his garage by himself? Uh, <laughs> that was one of the first viral yeah. videos on the internet. I, I remember that. Yeah. And then there was the lady in the, the Chewbacca mask. Oh, Chewbacca yeah, mom. Chewbacca mom. Chewbacca mom. She was so friendly, wasn't yeah. she? Yeah. Do you, here's a bit of trivia for you. Do you know what Chewbacca's name was going to be originally? Because uh, uh, uh. this uh, again, there's there, dog man. There's been a lot of. Uh, <laughs> well, Barf. actually, yeah. Originally, in one of the one of the first scripts, Han Solo was not going to be a human character. He was going to be play, or he was going to be an alien. With like green skin and, and something like that, mm. and Chewbacca was going to be his dog, and it was going to be an actual dog, not a gigantic oh dog man. And the dog's name was going to be Indiana. Ah, uh, oh, which he would then later use oh. for obviously Indiana Jones, because yeah, yeah, that didn't yeah. come out until after Star Wars had yeah, been a big hit. couple years. Yeah, but okay. as the script changed, I mean, there's that was one of the cool things about. Rogue One and about The Force Awakens is that some of the names that they're using are coming from kind of old... It, like, if you know Star Wars history, yeah, then you, you get kind of excited. Like, Luke Skywalker's name in the original script is going to be Luke Starkiller. I did remember I that. I did yeah. see that one. Yeah. yeah. And so... I think you sent me that one. By the way, Anthony... The Force Awakens, when they go to Starkiller base, you get a little excited. Yeah. But... Anthony, next time I do trivia, I want you on my team. <laughs> <laughs> I I am good for useless information. Maybe we can just have a story cauldron trivia team and I, we just, oh, you know. That would be so much fun. We're like the ringers in every different trivia. Ooh, let's <laughs> take over the world. Okay. <laughs> we'll take over the world one bar at a time. Exactly. Oh, hey. Forget this podcast. Pretty sure let's I saw that movie. <laughs> so. Okay, so we talked about what it was. All the other things, all the spoofs. So, like, now, like, what will it be? Because now it's, you know, owned by Disney. Oh, man. I think we've we've kind of touched on that one already. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to move it along because I really need to pee. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of unclear what it's going to be other than uh, the continuation of the phenomenon. I mean, it's getting a, a section of Disney... World, Disney yeah, World, Disney the, the World, land. and I think I think it's Disney and World. Disneyland. I think they're, oh my build, gosh, they're building a Star Wars section, which means I'm going to have to go back to Disney World now. I'm very excited for that. <laughs> um, they have uh, so there's this new movie coming out this week. Yeah, there's uh, Episode Nine is going to they're going to do one more in the trilogy. They they're finishing up the Han Solo movie, which should come out next year, which is going to be a prequel all about Han Solo. They've announced I can't wait. a few others. The the fellow who is directing, who has directed episode eight, has already been slated to direct another trilogy within the Star Wars universe, uh, which he has said is going to be disconnected from the Skywalker saga. So it's going to okay. be something kind of within that world, but completely separate. I I know there's been rumors of a Boba Fett movie. Oh, which would be fantastic because he yeah. was he's one of the coolest, most mysterious characters from the original trilogy. Intriguing. I mean, so it's it, it's kind of up in the air, just like how they keep churning out superhero movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Disney owns LucasArts now, so I can't imagine they're going to stop this gravy train. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Disney's collecting all of these different license and, uh, and uh, studios and just it's i'm i'm excited to see what happens i'm kind of scared at the same time but yeah i i know I'll, i and i think that's why the force awakens was so similar to 
A New Hope because A, Disney had bought it and so people were nervous and B, yeah. people were nervous after the prequels too. So J.J. Uh, Abrams was proving to everybody, no, 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 no. We can still make a good movie. Here we go. Yeah. We, we know what we're doing. We, we, we know where we're from. Here's something that you're going to recognize and still love. Because it's not exactly the same I, as A New Hope. I mean, it's, it's extremely reminiscent, but it's not identical. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I'm excited to, to mm-hmm. see. Well, we're running out of time, but um, we've got a couple more things that we need to address really quick. What's that? Recommendations. <laughs> uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm reminding you, John McClane, who would win? <laughs> well, yeah, but okay, I, I recommend it to everybody. Okay, now we can get to John McClane. <laughs> okay, I recommend it to everybody too. Well, I think yeah. it's good. Don't miss out. Yeah, honestly, I uh, if you want to be familiar with a cultural conversation, yeah, yeah, you got to know about it. Yeah, you have to watch it to Don't know be left out. Don't be like me talking about. So. Um, and John McClane, I, I know this question's coming. I know I it, have been waiting. Who are we talking about? Are we talking well, about yeah, Vader? Or are we, we talking gotta about be Solo? More specific. I think Vader would clean McClane's clock. I think you're right. I think Han Solo. Oh, that would be that would a be battle. a cool fight. That would be a battle. That would be just like the Indiana Jones thing, that. where I hope they just walk uh, off into a bar called the Sunset. I think. Um, <laughs> I I think Han would win because Long lost twin brother <laughs> Han would no. shoot first. Oh yeah yeah. No yeah, question. Yeah, true. Han would shoot first. Han would shoot first. Han has always shot Han first. Han has always shot first. Obviously, so he would <laughs> he would cheap shot John McClane before McClane could ever drop any f bombs. So, yeah, before he would even know what was going on. Yippee! Ca- <laughs> <laughs> End of movie. <laughs> End of fight. Okay, or, John McClane oh, and Luke Skywalker. Get this: though. the Millennium uh, Falcon blows up McClane's <laughs> ship called Nakatomi's <laughs> Tower. <laughs> That's yeah. yeah. Forget the. Uh, for, Forget the, the helicopters. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's all about Falcon blows it up. a helicopter-shaped Nakatomi ship. Um, <laughs> I, I do think McLean would beat Luke Skywalker, though. Especially, especially from this yeah. first movie. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. by the time you get to Return of the Jedi, Skywalker might be able to hold his own against McLean. See, I don't know still, though. But like, you think? we'll discuss that in another time. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because exactly. we will be doing more Star Wars episodes. Yes, we will. I like it. Just keep listening. I'm putting it out in the universe. Now it has to happen. Now it has to happen. You've done it. (laughs) All right. So, yeah, that totally brings us to the end of the hour. Thanks for joining us today on The Story Cauldron. The music for this episode is from the band Hook Sounds. And if you like what you've heard, uh, you can follow us for more on Instagram, on, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Just search for Story Cauldron or The Story Cauldron. Oh, and check out uh, thestorycauldron.com if you want to know more about us on this side. Trust me, my bio is just as annoying as I am on here. Um, <laughs> and Bobby and Anthony have really good ones. Uh, and don't forget to rate us on iTunes and leave us a review. Yeah, it helps other people find our podcast, and it lets us know if what we're doing is what you want to hear. Um, and don't forget to uh, hit us up and give us some suggestions for some new movies. We're about to start the new year, and we need some recommendations. That's right. So uh, we had some good feedback from folks already. People suggested a couple of really great ideas. Yeah, exactly, on, and some movies that I've not seen. So I'm, I'm excited Ooh. to. Uh, yeah. Ooh, you can pull a Garrett. Something new. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, until next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.